All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, truth versus validity, falsity versus fallacy. And um, so a little bit of, um, you know, kind of a play on words here, but this idea here that information is argument. Um, and that's, um, I was thinking about this as I was uh, starting to prepare for some of my other sessions that I'll be doing. Um, I have a session, um, I did one um, it, for the True North Academies down in Miami. I did that, I think it was at April or March or April, it all blurs together at some point. Um, but I was working on it then. And then I have another session coming up next, uh, not next week, but the week following, if you're going to be at the ACCS convention um, in Texas. Um, so anyway, so but I've been really thinking about some of the dynamics um, and how we need to be thinking about logic and truth and goodness and beauty and those kinds of things. Um, and so I was, as I was thinking, I, I started to really hone in on this idea that information is argument. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talk, talking with you a little bit about that today. Um, this, um, this session is going to be broken up kind of into three parts. Um, the first part is I'm, I'm going to just kind of very quickly go through um, some of the curriculum that we use at Classical Academic Press and kind of highlight for you how and when the, those pieces could be used in a logic into rhetoric uh, program. And then um, I'll, I have this talk about truth versus uh, validity, falsity versus fallacy. We'll talk about that. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A as well. Um, and our whole team has now made it uh, onto the, um, into the webinar. That's great. So Joe is here too, and he'll, he's going to help facilitate the event. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I'll just kind of go ahead and keep going here. So I'll, I'll start with some of our, our texts um, and, and walk, walk us through it here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a quick second here while we kind of go through some of this. Um, so um, at Classical Academic Press, we don't, we don't write this first set of curriculum, but it's a really good kind of preparation for critical thinking and problem solving and um, kinds of ideas. And it's the reasoning and reading series that we publish. And a lot of folks are wondering what can they do with their third, fourth, fifth, maybe even sixth graders um, uh, as they're getting, you know, as they're starting to think about um, you know, critical thinking and problem solving and just coming up with some good, uh, you know, reasoning skills, um, whether it's um, analogy or good, um, good sort of um, syntax and, and, and laying out of thoughts and thinking really well. Um, and, and especially for folks who maybe are homeschooling or for schools that want to kind of weave some of this in. At that age, we really say that students should stay in a good grammar program, learning language. Um, that, is the, that is the foundation of good communication. You can't be a good communication communicator without having a solid foundation in, in word and language. Um, so uh, reasoning and reading would be a great tool to maybe supplement into a, a grammar program that you're that you're using um, and a way to kind of help students be thinking through some of those um, more analytical kinds of ideas that you maybe want to foster a little bit. Um, but when they when the students are really ready and and I do I do usually say that students really should hold off on taking logic. I mean, I mean unless you just want to teach them, you know, some you know, like some some tricks, you know, not tricks, but, you know, um, just a sort of a quick vocabulary list of a couple, I mean, students can pick up on those kinds of things, but if if you really want to turn it into a study, um, I recommend that we, you not start that study until they're in the seventh grade, um, and that's usually to accompany the, um, the art of argument text, and the reason why I say that is because um, uh, students, first of all, that well-stocked mind so that they can be thinking about how to apply logical principles and analyzing ideas, um, they've really got to have sort of a breadth and depth of knowledge and information that they can talk with, uh, you can talk with them about freely. It's not supposed to be, logic is not supposed to say in the confines of a, of a textbook. It's really supposed to be lifted out into and used in the world around you. Um, and so it's, um, it's, I think it's essential that you be able to talk with them about important subjects. Um, you'll notice that in the Art of Argument textbook, there are some very silly examples, of course, um, and you know some very tongue-in-cheek examples and you know puns and you know that kind of thing. I mean, we, it is intended for children, but we also do talk about things like terrorism. What's the difference between terrorism and capital punishment? We talk about you know the abortion issue comes into play. Um, 
uh, we talk about, you know, gun control, we talk about different religions, we, you know, there, there's issues that we discuss, um, and then we, we apply principles of good reasonable thinking um, and identify fallacies that can be made um, in anybody's argument, even if you agree with the conclusion. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk today, the difference between truth and validity and something being false and there being a fallacy. It's, that's an important distinction for kids to be able to make. Um, very often when I have taught logic classes in the past, students think that every fallacy that's included in here means that the argument's false, and that's just simply not true. Um, so it's, um, we, there's some of this kind of abstract thinking, of course you're going to have students who have a well-stocked mind and they're ready for some abstract thinking and some analytical thinking before seventh grade, fine. But by and large, we have to give a rule of thumb, so we give a rule of thumb, and generally that rule of thumb is go with maybe seventh grade as the general rule of thumb. Um, students at that point can feel pretty comfortable with understanding some of those, some of those more abstract ideas. The discovery of deduction is um, the other half of an introduction to logic. So we usually say take a good year and master the fallacies um, and go ahead and really spend time um, with your students, uh, sort of plumbing the depths, um, not just using it as a vocabulary list. There's 28 words. If you were just going to memorize 28 words, it, it wouldn't take you all year. But that's not the point. The point is to start looking for them in the world all around you and giving them time to practice them so that they can really own and master them. Remembering that they probably aren't going to take another class in logic um, where they're going to be identifying informal fallacies, maybe ever. And so you really don't want to skim through this. You want to give them a nice, broad experience of learning what the fallacies are before you just move on to the, to some, the next thing. But when they are ready, and we usually say eighth grade for the discovery of deduction, um, it is, um, we always talk about logic being a two-sided coin, that it's both an art and a science, and the artistic side, if you will, is the more linguistic side, and that's the, the art of argument side, and the science side doesn't have anything, at least in our book, to do with science per se, or math per se, but it does have to do with formal logic, and formal logic just simply means that there um, are these when we look at these arguments, they have a set form and a set structure. Um, a lot of folks, when we talk about informal and formal fallacies or informal and formal logic, a lot of folks think of it as sort of like informal logic is the jeans and t-shirt version of logic. And then formal logic is the, um, you know, the tuxedo version of a lot of very serious, you know, business kind of thing. And that's not really what, what we mean here. Formal just means that we put, um, we analyze arguments that are in a syllogism and that syllogism has a form, um, which we, we aren't going to get into today, but that there's a form to it. And informal, just like inconsistent or um, inflammable or um, any other prefix within means it's not doesn't have a form, right? It's not an inconsistent. It means not consistent. Um, and so the in in informal just simply means that it, the informal fallacies from the art of argument, well, they don't have a set form or structure to them. So that's the kind of the two differences between the art of argument and the discovery of deduction. And we usually say, again, as a plumb line, as a baseline kind of thing, we usually say start the discovery of deduction after your student has successfully completed a course in pre-algebra. And I wanna be very clear about this. There's no math in the discovery of deduction. There's no math in there. That's not why we say it. It's just that if your student is able to reason in the abstract and solve for a variable, right? Some, some X, some Y, right? Some, some kind of, and, and they're able to kind of think through that and not necessarily need to have the shape and have it be in, entirely literal, if you will, very, if it doesn't have to be concrete, then the students are ready to start kind of an, um, testing um, syllogisms for validity. Um, and, and that can involve some, um, that can involve some um, abstract thinking. So again, we say for logic, there's two parts to the, a logic series. There's the informal or inductive side of logic. There's the formal deductive side of logic. Together, they make for an um, introductory course in logic. So it's very important that students do both. Um, and we do say maybe do the art of argument in the seventh grade, discovery of deduction, 
in the eighth grade. And from there, once the students have a foundation of logic in place, um, as we see in Aristotle, he goes on from understanding um, from from his understanding of deductive reasoning um, to start talking about rhetoric. And so what we do is we move students a little bit more gently through. We start introducing them to debate and argumentation by going through everyday debate and the argument builder. Um, and these are both kind of half semester classes. So it's not uncommon for students to do the art of argument in the seventh grade, discovery of deduction in the eighth grade, do everyday debate for the first half of ninth grade and then finish up ninth grade with argument builder, which is kind of a pre rhetoric text. And it includes the common topics in here um, and really takes introduces the idea of the five canons of rhetoric just a little bit. Um, and then, of course, um, students in the 10th grade are really ready to start a full course in rhetoric. And that's where the Rhetoric Alive um, and then the Rhetoric Alive thesis book come into play as well. So um, those are that's sort of the trajectory. There's some wiggle room in there if you've got students who are a little bit you know, older or younger when they're kind of starting in on things. But the point is that um, um, there's no there's no need to necessarily rush things. Your students have loads of time. And if the students, if this really is going to be their only opportunity to learn logic, you want to kind of place it in a context where it's going to be able to serve them for as long as possible. Um, and hopefully they'll take another class maybe when they get to um, when they get to college, maybe they'll take a few philosophy classes, but you never know. Um, and we just want them to be able to have it and hold it and really own it and apply it to their adult world, um, giving it to a fifth grader, which I've, I've had families ask. Again, not the end of the world, it's great exposure, but you have to ask yourself sort of, you know, what, you know, what, how, you know, how much of what you learned as a fifth grader do you really hold on to and master and can apply with any, you know, in that way? And it's sometimes it's better to kind of learn some of those life skill kinds of things, which is what logic really is, maybe a little bit later or at least revisit it um, over time. Um, so I'll stop there with sort of an overview of the curriculum because I do want to make sure I have time to go through my, my talk. Um, and then, um, and then we'll also have time for questions. I see that some of you are kind of wondering where to put questions. The chat box is just that, it's for chat. Um, you don't feel like, I probably won't be looking at it during the session, um, just because that will probably distract me a little bit from the talk that I'm giving. Um, but if you have questions, Joe is going to be managing the Q&A box down at the bottom. So if you move your mouse around in the Zoom window, you'll see that there's a Q&A button. And if you click on that, you should be able to type in your questions and then Joe will make sure that he um, either records your question for us to um, answer at another time or um, he'll be kind of facilitating the questions when we get to the end and some of your questions might be asked of me live and, and I'll go ahead and answer them. Um, so that's a little bit of that housekeeping. Um, and then I'll say just one more time because I, um, I said it a little bit earlier and there have been some additional folks who've come on. Everybody will get a recording of today's session if you registered, which clearly all of you did who are sitting here right now, um, and everybody else who didn't reg uh, who register but isn't able to make it. Um, they will, everybody who registered will get a copy, a video copy of the link to, to today's session. So that will be emailed to you. Um, I'm not sure, it might not be today, but it, it'll be either, some, you know, some, probably sometime next week, but possibly today. All right, so with that, I'll go ahead and kind of turn our attention to, you know, that's some of the curricular resources that you can kind of be thinking through. And really now to start thinking about what is the difference between truth and validity, falsity and fallacy, and this idea that information is argument. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I'll give you um, just a little bit of information about myself as well, so that um, you have maybe a little bit of a context for who I am and what we've, you know, what my journey has kind of been um, in exploring these questions. Um, my name again is Joelle Hodge. I am the co-author of both The Art of Argument and The Discovery of Deduction. Um, I will have been married for 25 years next month. Um, so it's a good man to stick with me all those years. Um, we are the proud parents of one 14-year-old 
daughter who um, I have been promising to give a logic class to, um, and she is going through logic with me uh, this summer, and, and I, she seems to be excited about it. Um, and I've been working in classical education since about 1999. And underneath the colored hair here, I have a lot of gray hair that is um, maybe in part from all of those kids, but uh, maybe maybe a couple of gray hairs from that 25 year long marriage as well, um, and probably just some from myself. But um, but I started as a logic and humanities teacher um, at a small classical school here in the area. Um, I was one of the founding owners of Classical Academic Press. I'm no longer an owner, but still very much involved here at the press, um, and very excited about. Um, all of the projects that we have coming up. Um, we are in the middle of um, building out a lower school history curriculum and an upper school um, history curriculum as well, like a humane letters curriculum. We're um, gonna be building out a middle school curriculum to kind of link those two things together. Um, we already have a writing and a grammar, logic and Latin and some other courses, uh, uh, disciplines as well. And we're toying with the, well, as you, and you probably know that we acquired Novari Science just a couple of years ago um, with John Mays, which has been a wonderful addition. Um, and we've just had so much, um, we've had so much great feedback from folks um, since we started working with John too. So that's been exciting to see as well as we've acquired Novari. And we're starting to think about whether or not we want to consider the building out of a math curriculum, a, a classical mathematics curriculum. Um, and so there's conversations kind of going on behind the scenes right now about what we might do and when and all of those kinds of things. So um, uh, let's see here. So uh, today, though, I no longer work in the classroom. Um, you're, see, you're in my office right here at Classical Academic Press. Um, I am now sit as the Vice President of Operations, Sales, and Marketing, which is another very full job. Um, but now I have more opportunities to support the work of educators in schools and homeschools by both ensuring that they receive uh, the resources and, and the supplies that they need to carry on their work, but to also support our schools and educators with con um, consultations and teacher training. Um, and so there's webinars like this, there's seminars that I'll be going to at the SCL and ACCS and CERSE conferences this summer. Um, but then I've also been invited to go out to a network of schools out in uh, Utah um, in August. Um, they've recently adopted our logic program and invited me to come out and do teacher training for all of their teachers for a few days, which is which is great news. Um, we're also talking to a school in uh, Ecuador, um, and there's the possibility that I might have an opportunity to go meet with some, um, some classical educators who are trying to build up their classical school in Ecuador as well. So that's also a lot of fun um, these days too. So, um, so that's a little bit about my background um, in classical education um, and in particular with logic um, and a little bit of that journey um, as well. I want to talk a little start my talk today by talking about your role as an educator in this endeavor of teaching logic to your student and how it shapes the outcomes of the kids. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm asking this question, uh, you've, and I start this question with almost all of my talks. So if you've, if you've gone to one in the past, you may have seen me ask this question before, but I do think it's really important to remind ourselves that a student who is fully trained is going to become like someone. And we have to ask who is that student going to become like? And the answer of course is it's taken from Luke 6, uh, 640. These are the words of Jesus. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher but everyone when he is fully trained will become like his teacher. And so um, it's just a good reminder that um, if we want our students to know how to apply logic in this rational and you know, um, irrational world that we live in we must be modeling its application. Um, so today I'm going to really um, address three quick points for all logic teachers to consider and not just consider for your students, but also consider for yourselves. Um, and we could easily spend an hour on each of these topics alone. So bear with me as I move kind of quickly. Like I said, I do wanna leave some time to take questions at the end, but the goal of teaching and providing logic courses should be to produce philosophers. And what I mean by that is seekers of truth, and lovers of wisdom. That's, that's who I hope that we are forming. Um, and so we have to consider how we train them to do this. And I think we, th this is a multifaceted answer. And today we're just going to talk about two, two ways. And one is that I think we need to recognize that information is not benign, that information is argument. And the second thing I wanna talk about again briefly is recognizing that there's a difference between validity and truth and fallacy and falsity. 
So um, we're going to start by talking about this, this first idea that the goal of the courses, um, of your logic courses, um, should be to produce philosophers. And again, I am defining philosophers as those people who are seeking truth, not seeking to be right, <laughs> but seeking truth and loving wisdom. Um, so the, the purpose of, of teaching students is to enable them to be truth seekers. Our goal is to provide them with the right tools of thinking coupled with the strength of moral and intellectual virtues so that they can confidently wade into the arena of life and determine what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. If you take nothing away else away from this session, I, I really do beg you to remember this, that this, um, that the purpose of logic is not to do these things. The purpose of it is not to teach them the informal fallacies because some ancient Greeks thought it was important or to help them vote for the right candidate someday. And it's not to help them pick the right religion. And it's not to help them win an argument with someone who doesn't support their views on Black Lives Matter or to help them outwit someone who disagrees with their position on transgender issues. The purpose of teaching students logic is, enable, is to enable them to be truth seekers, to provide them with the right tools of thinking coupled with the strength of moral and intellectual virtues so that they can confidently wade into the arena of life and determine what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. That's really the goal. These other issues are important issues for sure. Um, and I, I have great hopes for you know, what um, faith journey my daughter will take someday. And I also have beliefs about different political issues that are facing us. And I do believe that there are ethical and moral consequences to some of those choices. But that's not the purpose for me teaching her those, teaching her logic. My goal is to help them, her to be somebody who is focused on and has a desire for really knowing what is true and what is good and what is beautiful. And if I can enable her and equip her with the right tools of thinking and couple that with the strength of moral and intellectual virtues, then I can be sure that she's going to be able to confidently wade into the arena of light, life and determine what those things are that are true and good and beautiful. So it's really, um, and rather than focusing on several individual things that you want to get them to get the right answer on, we want them to equip them with the tools to be able to get to the right answer in every case or as much as possible with humility um, that, that we can. So I do want to say here that, and I think this is true, that students who lack confidence in their ability to reason well are going to be students who lack confidence in living and living well. They are going to shrink back from the world because they won't be able to see past the emotion or past the irrelevancies or past the assumptions or past the muddled thinking. And when they can't see past it and they can't figure out how to navigate through it, they're either going to become weary from it and avoid it, and they're gonna retreat from their responsibilities as a citizen, or they're gonna get sucked into some of the nonsense and become part of the problem. So a solid foundation of clear, rational thinking provides students with the ability to get past all the mess and seek what is really true, be able to see their way through it. So how can we ensure that they walk out of your school or out of your homeschools with a firm foundation, appropriately confident, not, not with hubris, but appropriately confident in their ability to apply reason and virtue and the life that they're called to live? Well, that brings us to these next two points here. We have to train them to do this. And the first thing that we're going to talk about, and again, there aren't just two ways to do this, but the, for the purposes of today's talk, I've narrowed it to two, that we need to help them to recognize that information is not benign. Okay. So I'm going to illustrate this by asking this question. How often do teachers start a sentence with the word because. And I give I have three examples here. So a student asks your history teacher, why did the South want to secede from the North? And your teacher is going to start with an answer, because, right? In fact, you might even be asking your students, why did this happen? And it's not a fact. It's not just a piece of information. Think about this. They're starting with because. And when your student asks your literature teacher, why was Elizabeth Bennett initially, initially put off by Mr. Darcy, you, your teachers would respond, well, because, 
and they'd fill in the blank and kind of go on. And if a student asks your physics teacher, how do we know that the force of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared? Your teacher is going to respond, well, because, right? And there's going to be some answer that goes along with it. And notice that when your students are asking these questions, they're asking the kinds of questions that we all say we want your, our students to ask. They're asking the why and the how questions. And the why and the how questions don't have just a fixed fact as an answer. They have, whoops, a, be a premise that's being given to them because is a premise indicator, right? If you start anything with because, you're starting to list off reasons for why you believe what you believe. Your teachers aren't providing an answer when they start their sentences with because. They're giving the students reasons for why they believe something to be true. And when we seem to think that when our arguments poses answers or information that somehow they're benign in some way. Information is never benign. There are always issues of relevance. There's always presumption. There's always clarity issues imbued into every fact that you teach your students. The word because is a premise indicator and it lets you know that in each of those cases, your teachers are building an argument for why they believe what they believe to be true. They're attempting to provide rational reasons for or against an idea or action with the intent to persuade your students to believe the same thing. Every point of knowledge begins with an argument and all knowledge begins and ends with reasoning. And that's a very important concept for your students to know and for teachers to know as well, that we are in fact not just giving out benign pieces of information, but information comes as a form of argument and it, and it is built and begins with reasoning. The second point that we could talk about, and again, we could talk about that idea for a good long while, but we're gonna move on so we have time for questions at the end here. The second way that we can train our students to be seekers of truth and lovers of wisdom is to help them to understand the difference between validity and truth, those are not the same thing and they're not synonyms for one another, and fallacy and falsity. Again, they're, they both start with F, F -A, um, F -A -L, <laughs> um, but they're not synonyms for one another. They do not mean the same thing. The second way to train students to become seekers of truth and lovers of will, wisdom is to help them learn that there are a difference between these ideas. Truth and validity are two terms that are often used interchangeably. Philosophers know that there is a difference in these words. So while your students are studying logic and learning to build their arguments, it's going to be important for them to learn and use these terms appropriately. They are both essential and accurate for rational communication, but they are not the same. All right, um, I just wanted to take a quick second and talk here about mysteries um, and secrets revealed through reason. Um, we investigate with our reason. Uh, and so I'm gonna read this. This is from um, Hugh of St. Victor from the Didascalicon. He writes, now every finite or defined matter is better known and able to be grasped by knowledge, teaching. Moreover, it begins with those things that are better known and by acquainting us with those Works it way it works it way it works its way into matters which are, lie hidden or their secrets or mysteries. Furthermore, we investigate with our reason, the proper function of which is to analyze. When by analysis and investigation of the nature of individual things, we descend from universals to particulars. This is a very complex linguistic way of basically saying that we can get from universal prem, from universal ideas down to particular points of truth and falsity by using our reason. And that's why it's so important when we're teaching our students, not just to make sure that they know the right facts and they can fill in the right bubble on the, on the test, or even to write in the right fill in the blank answer or pick the right multiple choice answer, but they really understand the reasoning that's involved to get to the right answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a um, it's often help, helpful to explain truth and validity in this way, that these are, it's a little bit of an equation, if you will, that if you have true information as your premises, and if you are constructing your arguments in a valid, strong way, that you'll end up with a sound argument. And a sound argument is one that is logically valid, and it's free from error and any kind of falsity. 
That's that's what a logical, valid, uh, sound argument is. And we want our arguments to be sound. So not only do your kids need to be equipped with the knowledge of what is true, but we really also need to get them to understand that how they construct those arguments is also an essential part of being right um, or finding what is true. What good philosophers are really after is making sound arguments. And to get there, we need both of those two building blocks, truth and val validity. Truth is vitally important to everyone in every culture throughout all of human he history. People expect others to be truthful and honest and to give an appropriate account of the situation by using accurate facts and information. It's actually hard to think of a single culture that values lying and the deliberate telling of falsehoods um, over the telling the truth. Um, truth is the foundation upon which we make judgments and build our perceptions of the world and how we live. Many conflicts do arise um, as a result of people disagreeing about what the truth of a situation is. And it cannot be overstated how important it is to be people who are in pursuit of truth, to be those truth seekers as the primary goal here in getting to what is right. Truth is essential for communication and for form and for forming um, our lives and a basis of understanding. Knowing the truth, the way we sort of define what is truth is having a right understanding of reality. And that's an important concept because we do live in a world here where everybody you know, sort of talks about you speak your truth, what's your truth. There is, there is something that is, and we have to be clear about this, that there is such a thing as reality and having a right understanding of what is in reality is what it means to be in, you know, in possession of the truth. The difficulty with truth though, <laughs> is that it's impossible to know everything. Um, validity is another major building block necessary to create those sound arguments and validity helps overcome that gap when we can't know everything. It's another abstract idea. It has to do with the architecture of an argument or the structure or the form of it. The validity of an argument doesn't depend on facts or truth, but how an argument is put together. And when, when you take a course like the discovery of deduction, you'll see that syllogisms have a set form and structure. And I'm, I'm trying to explain to my daughter and the other kids that I'm, um, her friend that I'm teaching right now, which is that when you, um, there's three terms and only three terms. Sentences have to start and end a particular way. They all have to have um, you know, a verb of being that connects the subject and the predicate. Um, there's a whole bunch of rules that we follow. There's about eight rules to test for validity. When, a, when an argument in that kind of a structure, that syllogism structure um, is, is organized in the right way, if you have true premises and if your construction's valid, it's like using a calculator. You can just pull the lever and a true conclusion is going to pop out every single time with certainty. Um, but obviously we need to make sure that we have true premises and we need to make sure that our construction is valid. And again, that's something that you would take, you know, that's, that's an entire course to teach students how to build syllogisms and understand what the, um, what the core of a good sound syllogism is. But I do remind students that a syllogism, the core of a syllogism, is actually the heart of a thesis. And so when students are going through the, the, um, the process of learning how to build an outline for papers that have a thesis and an argument that they're trying to make, if you are a teacher who knows and understands how to build valid arguments through syllogism, getting your students to build a core syllogism that's valid is an essential part of teaching them how to be good writers. <clears throat> Um, most history books don't talk about arguments that occurred over time. Instead, they lay out the historical facts about what has occurred over time. And as a result, most students have practiced and learned the art of fact checking since they've begun their learning career. But few students have learned the art of building valid arguments. And if your students are like most students, they might even feel like in some cases, it's been more important that they know the right answer rather than understanding why or how the answer is correct. So as educators, we have to really be asking ourselves, what are we evaluating with those tests and quizzes that we give to them? Is it more important that they can just re regurgitate information or is the, you know, so in other words, is the emphasis on getting the right answer 
leading to them having disjointed and disconnected thinking because we're not actually asking them to show evidence of good, rational, valid thinking in any way. What are you really testing for? Are you testing their memorization capacity or are you testing to see what is it they think? How are they thinking? And that changes how you create your assessments for students depending on what it is you're testing for. You can test for memorization or you can test for thinking. Very often, you can't do both and weight them in the exact same way. A lot of students can memorize and cram, but that's not necessarily the best um, evidence of them understanding. Knowing why someone believes what they believe is just as important as believing the thing itself. Understanding the whys and hows of an issue give your students the ability to think about, not just memorize, and believe it or not, there's a lot of sloppy and bad ways to think and reason about information. Here's one example. Suppose your students or you were asked to complete a math problem in your pre-algebra class, and suppose that you didn't, that your student really didn't understand how to answer down on their paper. And the next day in class, the teacher reviewed that homework and the student realized that they got the right answer they put the right answer down, but that student really didn't complete the process the correct way. The question is, by doing that and not knowing the process, how much better off is that student? The next time they, they come face to face with a problem that's very similar to that, it's still going to be very challenging for them because it's an instance of getting the right answer, but not having the right thinking. And right thinking will help students get the right answer every time, or at least more often, but it's, it, it won't, they won't have to rely on things like good guesstimates and good luck and, you know, that, that kind of thing um, anymore. And that is something that gives students a lot of confidence to help them take information that they do know. And if they can learn how to reason from what they already know to a new point of knowledge, now you've given them the tool of building towards new information. And that's another really important skill for students. Because like we said, we can't know everything, but we can start with generally held widely accepted principles. And we should be able to begin reasoning with other right pieces of information towards further enlightenment through to further knowledge. So to be truth seekers and lovers of wisdom, our students need to not only understand the facts and how they relate to reality, <clears throat> but they also need to learn the right way of way of reasoning as well. And that's really the underlying hope that I, I hope to be able to convey to you um, as we talk here today. So lastly, I'll just sort of put here, I've, I've gone over some of our texts that we have. Um, for those of you who are teachers and maybe you wanna be teaching, um, and I, I, I've done this myself, so I don't like to be limited to just what my students have as a textbook because sometimes that sort of limits what kind of understanding I can really have. So if you are going to be a teacher who might be teaching the discovery of deduction this year, you might want to pick up a copy of Socratic Logic by Peter Kraft. Um, there's another introductory logic text, and this one's um, the next two, Introduction to Logic and Essentials of Logic. These are much heavier, you know, like college textbooks. But if that's something that interests you and you kind of want to be thinking you through it, the, the text by Copey and Cohen um, are also really helpful. And then, of course, there's The Art of Argument and the Discovery of Deduction by Dr. Larson and myself. Um, and then, of course, there's always Classical U that we have here at Classical Academic Press to help you be able to, you know, watch us teaching some of these courses, not just um, so we can teach you the information, but even how to teach the information. So that's another great resource that we have on Classical U as well. So I'll go ahead and stop there for now. Um, and uh, that's, that's my presentation here. And I think we have about 18 minutes for questions. So I'll throw it to you, Joe. Thank you, Jolie. On behalf of everyone who's joining us today, we appreciate uh, your time and your exploration of this topic. Um, I'll echo what Jolie said earlier, just for everyone, in case you missed it, there will be a, a copy of today's uh, webinar made available next week to you. Um, and uh, along with that, we'll also send links to some of the texts, the Classical U course um, that Jolie's referenced um, so that you have instant access to that as well. Um, one other comment for me before we dive into Q&A here uh, is that 
We might not be able to get all of our, our questions today, or you may think of a question, a really good question after the webinar is over, uh, if that's the case, or if you're watching this uh, five years from now and you have a question, <laughs> we encourage you to send your question to info at classicalsubjects.com and a member of our team will address it. I'll put that email address uh, in the chat box before we conclude today. That's info at classicalsubjects.com. Um, just a quick note we like to make in case you think of your question after we've concluded. Um, for now, we do have some great questions. Uh, typed an answer to a few already. Thank you to those that, that did submit a question that I was able to type an answer to. I marked down a few as ones that um, we'd like to answer live. Sure. And I'll start with this one from Carrie. Uh, Julie, Carrie asks um, about uh, teaching logic to students who have uh, particularly art of argument students um, who, who have mixed backgrounds, as in some have studied logical fallacies and others are new to the study of logic. So what would be the best next step when we're teaching a, a mixed group of logic learners? Sure. So um, the great thing about the art of argument is that you don't have to you don't have to know any logic to get started. So that's that's great. Um, and the great thing about uh, and I kind of alluded to this, that very often students only get one shot at logic. And that's really too bad in many ways. So if you've got a blend of students to, who have had logic and have been exposed to the informal fallacies before, and you have some brand new students, this is an opportunity to really have those students who maybe are a little bit more seasoned, to have them um, responsible for finding fallacies, whether it's in literature that they read, movies that they watch, um, essays, speeches, um, news articles, um, you know, commercials, there's, there's all kinds of different ways that you can kind of put them in a space where they have to kind of demonstrate, hey guys, logic is everywhere, fallacies are everywhere. Um, it's, I think it's important to note that in literature, um, authors are, all authors are making an argument for something. Um, one book, and it, the, the topic might be a controversial one, but you could take it in either direction that you might want to, to go with it. There's a book called The Evolution of Calpurnia Tate, and um, it's this coming of age story about a 12 year old girl who's living in Texas at the turn of the 20th century. And the author, um, and at the start of every chapter is a quote by Charles Darwin. And if you are a fan of um, uh, evolution, then you, you would love the argue, author's argument. If you're not a fan of evolution, you would, all, you would be able to see that this author has a very clear argument that she is trying to make. You'll notice in there that every, every Christian character um, seems to be backwards thinking. Um, you know, they, they're the ones that can't be open-minded about anything. You know, she kind of stacks her, her characters in a particular way. Um, the grandfather who is more or less an agnostic, he, he seems to be the one that's kind of enlightened into the way of thinking about things as opposed to the rest of his family. And we have to remember that the author chose to make all of these characters this way. It, it, is, um, it, it is an argument that the author is making. You might love it, or you could use it as a very clear example. Your students could use it as a very clear example of how authors use their storytelling to make an argument. Um, and it, and it, you know, it's very obvious to do. Um, so, but you can find that in whether you can do it in Thomas Aquinas, you can do it with the evolution of Calpurnia Tate, you can do it with C.S. Lewis. Um, there's a whole range of places and your older students, the ones who maybe have gone through it before, they could actually lead some of those Socratic discussions with the ones who haven't done it and then be kind of in reinforcing this whole idea of, um, you know, by teaching we learn, which is another one of the classical principles of good pedagogy. So there's a lot of ways that you could do it and loads of resources out there. Thanks for that answer, Jolie. Uh, next, I'm gonna to turn to the question of propositional logic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of questions on propositional logic from John and Alan. Um, Alan asks specifically um, about your thoughts about teaching propositional logic in the upper school, um, as well as if CAP is planning on releasing a propositional logic text. And I know you mentioned a lot of texts that we're working on. I don't believe that's one of them at the moment. Um, and John kind of echoed that by asking your thoughts on getting students into propositional logic so if you could comment on the subject of propositional logic and its place, if at all, 
um, sure. in upper school learning? So, um, so the the easy the first question I'll answer is that um, uh, Dr. Dr. David Shank, who is who was a philosophy professor at Messiah University, he and I have talked probably for the last. 10 years off and on about wouldn't it be great if we wrote the sort of the sequel to the discovery of deduction and he and I have just been too busy to get around to doing that that now we are not the only two people on the planet who could write that book um, but it, it hasn't risen up to the level that um, uh, of, of the text that we're deciding to do in the near term so maybe someday but uh, as of right now you shouldn't be holding your breath for a cap textbook to do propositional logic that being said um, when you get through the discovery of deduction, you've really gotten to the point where um, when you when you pick up a copy of Aristotle's rhetoric and he's assuming that students have had logic, he's assuming that students have basically had the equivalent of what we put out in the discovery of deduction. And so a student really is ready to go into a rhetoric course after they've completed a course in discovery of deduction. I'll, as a quick aside, I'll note that Rhetoric Alive actually builds in a very nice kind of quick review of some of the big, the major principles in discovery of deduction. So if you haven't had a chance to take that course and you kind of need to get started on Rhetoric, that might be a good book to kind of jump into um, because it does have a pretty good review in there. Anyway, um, now as far as propositional logic goes, logic can be used both in this in um, towards the stream of good writing and leaning more into rhetoric. But after discovery of deduction, you really do have two options. You could go in that rhetoric line where you're using syllogisms to help you build good arguments that you're gonna be writing with, but you could also lean and start moving into more symbolic logic and propositional logic. Um, students are going to get some version of this when they get to geometry anyway. Um, there's a lot of overlap between propositional logic and the principles of geometric or geometry. Um, so you'll, your, your students are going to be exposed to it. I often found that, um, or I, I've, I've talked to folks before, that if you're going to have students go through something like the art of argument discovery of deduction, and you want to offer a propositional logic class, it's a really good idea to have them do that at the same year that they're doing geometry because they'll be reinforcing ideas going back and forth between those two classes and it's a great idea to kind of move in that direction that is going to be a direction that's not every student is brain is going to really kind of click that way um, and that might be one of those elective ideas that you decide some of our kids are, can move into that as whether it's because it's really leaning into that maybe more into mathematical students who might be wanting to be getting into like web development someday. Uh, I mean, I, I took it and I didn't end up in web development. I'm a liberal arts sort of generalist, if you will, but um, and I loved it. Um, and I think it can be a great enhancement, but you'd have to make a decision with the number of classes that you have at your school or your co-op or what, what have you about what, you know, what you're going to make mandatory and what you're going to make electives. And I can give Joe a list of some, some good resources that you could consider. And we can follow up via email if you wanted a couple of um, suggestions for some text to consider. There's, there's some really good ones out there. Thanks, Jolie. Uh, we will definitely send out several resources, including a few blog posts um, and some sample content uh, from our books as well for you guys. So be on the lookout for that follow-up email. That'll come Tuesday of next week. I'll note that again uh, when we wrap up, and that'll be delivered to the email address that you registered for. So we're excited to get that content to you. Moving on to our next question. We've had a few questions, Jolie, about kind of getting into the classical academic press logic sequence. Um, should teachers always be teaching art of argument before discovery of deduction? And what is the latest that students could kind of jump into art of argument? Is ninth grade, 10th grade too late to be doing art of argument? Could you comment on the sequence uh, briefly? Sure. So um, the if, if you're going to be sort of a purist about it, you would start with, you know, grammar and, you know, maybe we, the way that we would do it at CAP is we'd say well-ordered language and writing and rhetoric should probably begin maybe third or fourth grade and the student and, you know, a, a course in Latin and, you know, obviously other math, math classes and what have you, um, grant history and that kind of thing. But as far as these two streams of grammar and writing, they should be building those. And then at a certain point, grammar is going to drop off. You know, we, mo most times we don't still teach grammar and 
you know, middle school. Um, and it, even the CAP curriculum gets us from like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade or third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Um, and so when grammar, right about the time that grammar is going to be dropping off, that's a great time to build in the second of the trivium um, you know, pillars, if you will. There's grammar, logic, and rhetoric, right? And so if we're building towards that trivium stream, then grammar and writing kind of come together. When grammar drops off, you build in logic. Um, and then when, when you're ready, after you've taken discovery of deduction or some uh, uh, syllogisms, that's when you move into kind of blending those two together into rhetoric as the final stream in that trivium. And it really then incorporates, if you look at the, the five canons of rhetoric, there's um, invention or discovery, arrangement, um, oh gosh, I just, oh, style, memory, and delivery. Oh my goodness, it's my 48-year-old brain kirking out on me there. Yeah, so uh, discovery, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Um, and in the arrangement and the style, that's where we get into a lot of building in good grammar and syntax um, and, and making sure that all of that that they've learned throughout the study of good grammar and the pro gymnasmata and all those kinds of things get woven in with their good argument. Um, so that would be the, the basic idea. Now, people come to classical education at a variety of times. Not everybody starts when their kids are in the third or fourth grade. So um, the idea here is that, um, and I've talked with students, uh, or, sorry, teachers from all over the country. I'm working with that school in Utah that I mentioned, and they don't use the art of argument until their 12th grade AP literature class or a AP English class. Um, they give the discovery of deduction back in seventh and eighth grade. And so they flip flop them. Um, it's really what will work well with the program that you have. There are going to be some examples in the art of argument that might be a little bit sillier, um, you know, just a little bit more basic, but there's also some really meaty and substantial ideas that are in there that if your students, um, you know, if they don't mind kind of like a gentle and, you know, an easy way in, there's always more that you can do to show them how to use um, the art of argument and identify fallacies in the world around them. You don't have to be limited to the examples that we put in the textbook. We very often note that um, if you think back to maybe when your kids were very little and they were drawing pictures of people, in some ways they kind of, uh, and, and um, uh, Andrew Kern makes this point, which I, he probably does better than I do, but he talks about the way that little kids kind of draw and caricature. And we used to laugh that when Anna would draw pictures of, um, when my daughter would draw pictures of uh, my husband when she was little, she would put the top of, when she would draw, she'd put the top of his head right here, like right above his eyebrows. And joke, we would joke that she didn't leave any room for a brain in there, just the top of his head. But she got the shape and she got all the basic features and she gave him hair and everything. And it was kind of a caricature. Um, but then as she's gotten older, she has really really done quite well with her art. And she's, she draws some really spectacular, very realistic um, people, landscapes, et cetera, at this point. But she had to kind of have that easy intro. So there are some parts of art of argument that are a little bit easier to get into. And then it does get a little bit more challenging. And depending on the ages of your students, you can kind of apply and lean into different areas that really kind of suit whatever it is that you need. Thanks, Jolie. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes here, so we'll try to get through a few more questions. Uh, and then a reminder to you guys, is if we're not able to get to your questions today, send them to info at classicalsubjects.com. Uh, so Julie, we had uh, questions. Um, I'm going to, I'm kind of merging two into one here. Um, so teaching logic to two um, more uh, perhaps difficult groups of learners. One is students with disabilities and the other is adults. Uh, so could you comment on teaching logic or teaching perhaps specifically CAP logic texts to students with disabilities, with learning disabilities, and then also uh, a note on teaching logic to adults? Um, I thought that was a great question. We've seen that one before. Um, is it possible for adults to use CAP logic books? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, um, of course, it, uh, I'll start with the adult question first. Yeah, it's um, it, you, you could work through any textbook, of course, and you, again, it's very similar to maybe an older student. You would just kind of have to recognize that in some cases the book wasn't aimed right at you. Um, but I should also note that one of the projects that we are considering, um, there will be a new edition of the Art of Argument that's coming out next year, and it's going to have even more examples, uh, better explanations, uh, really updated. I mean, a lot, there's some examples in there that refer to people like. Um, 
uh, like Michael Jordan, um, who I still know the name of, but a lot of kids are like, who? Who's Michael Jordan? Um, so we, we've had to update with some of the examples so that, you know, it's not a barrier between, you know, culture and and where the kids are. Um, but as part of that, we're really thinking very carefully about this idea of making the uh, creating a logic text for adults to be used by adults. Um, and that will have a lot of the same core content, obviously, but really aimed at them and maybe some purposes and ways that they can use that information. So that is something that we're thinking about for next year. No promises on exactly when that might come out, but I'm hoping that we might have something that will come out when that next, the, the second and uh, 20th anniversary of the Art of Argument is ready to be um, ready to be launched as well. So more on that soon. But yes, it is possible to use the existing text. Of course, you just have to sort of make allowances for the fact that you're not, you know, 13 <laughs> when you read it. And I'm sure you can do that. Now, students with learning differences, that's a really great question. And that's going to be one, um, you know, that 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 phrasing, you know, is sort of all encompassing. And there's going to be students that have learning differences that can absolutely handle the content in the art of argument or the discovery of deduction. Maybe pacing needs to change, maybe explanations by the instructor needs to be, you know, a little bit more um, um, a little bit more robust, um, that kind of thing. But, you know, obviously there's going to, there, there might be a point with some students that they might not be able to do that, but, you know, that would have to be a, they might not be able to go through the text in the same way, um, but that would have to be a call that's made by the, uh, on a case by case basis with the, the student and the, the teacher that's going to be teaching it. But by and large, principles of reasoning are ones where if, if students really are able to reason and the vast majority of students with learning differences are students who can reason well, they might not be able to necessarily um, under, they, they might not have the, um, the ability in some cases to um, understand every single example just the way that it's been given. There might be some topics that they just may be more challenging for them to really understand the nuances of. But once you learn the principles, those principles can be given to students and, and talked about because every, every kid is trying to make his way and make sense of the world around them. Every kid is trying to do that. Um, and there's logical principles that are informing that. They are basing their thinking off of rational, reasonable skills that they are cultivating within themselves. They can be, um, they can, those things can be called out of them and those things can be named when they do them. Um, but there isn't a, there isn't a kid alive who doesn't, um, in, no matter where they are on the spectrum, that isn't using some form of rational thinking to get to make some form of decision. Um, and all of those things can be reinforced and named. Again, whether it's through an actual curriculum and a class that's graded, that might not be necessary. Um, but those principles, you can go through those principles with, the, with your kids um, and, and apply them once you know them and understand them yourself. Thanks, Julie. Uh, we, we have a, a, a question that was doubled up. I really like this question as well. Uh, and, and it is, I'm new to the subject of logic, or I need to brush up, how can I prepare myself as a teacher uh, to teach logic, um, either for the first time or maybe for the first time in years um, to my students, uh, perhaps even as early as this upcoming fall? What are some resources or some ways um, that teachers can prepare to teach the, the subject of logic well? Sure. Um, so if you're using our texts, um, Classical U is where that that's where to go. Um, uh, on Classical U, I, I think, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the Art of Argument discussion video is on, I think it's in there, but at a minimum, um, I do I teach, I think I might teach through the Art of Argument. I know I teach through the discovery of deduction and particularly for the discovery of deduction. Um, I not only actually teach the book as if I'm teaching it to a student, which you as a teacher could sit through and be taught logic by me, but then there's a second course on um, Classical U that teaches students, uh, teaches teachers who are going to be doing the discovery of deduction with their students how to teach it, 
which is a little bit different. It talks about um, some of the deduction and action exercises. What are some common pitfalls? What are some extra um, projects or papers or questions that you could ask your students to consider as they as you go through the text? So there's really two separate courses on Classical U for Discovery of Deduction. And I'm just not remembering because it's been a little while since we came out with the Art of Argument, the first one. Um, if I did a teaching of the Art of Argument, it might just be that it's the discussion video that we did a there is a teaching there is a teaching formal logic course on mm -hmm. classical u and there's also a essentials of formal logic course which i believe is the discussion video mm -hmm. and the lat there's a third one too that's uh, an, an informal fallacies course okay as well on classical u so we we currently have three classical u logic courses um all taught by jolie and uh um, like I said, we will make those um, easily accessible through your follow-up email next week. If you want to get a jump on those courses, head to classicalu.com. Um, we have a, uh, a logic subcategory in our course finder, and you'll be able to find them all there. Um, and I can even link that here in the chat box for anyone that is really eager uh, to get after it. You'll find their classicalu.com course finder to access those courses. Okay. A um, couple more questions, Joel. I think we'll go until 1210 here okay. and uh, get a few more questions in before we wrap up. A um, couple questions about um, syllogisms. Um, teaching sound syllogisms. How can teachers um, take steps in that direction and we have a question from Charlotte who asks, how do we learn to be a teacher who can teach sound syllogisms so that our students can get good core um, theses? That's a great question. I um, So the... I, I can't explain it like right now, but in the if you were to pick up a copy of the Discovery of Deduction or go through that classical U course, which would probably be enhanced by having the book in front of you because there isn't a copy of the book that goes with it, but I teach um, the basics of, I mean, I mean that's, that is what discovery of deduction sort of ends up with. You learn how to define terms correctly. You, you learn how to, you understand what simple apprehension is, judgment and inferences are. Um, and then part of that, that next stage, and in fact, I think it's all of unit two in the book is just dedicated to uh, teaching how to build syllogisms and test for validity. <clears throat> the, the, there are 176 different ways to build a syllogism. There's only 19 ways to build a valid syllogism. And you can learn the eight questions that you ask um, that you, will help you determine if your syllogism is valid or invalid. Um, and it's a very, it's, you know, it's very quick to, to learn those. They make sense, they're, they're reasonable. You sort of think, oh yeah, that makes sense that I would think about these two things. Um, some of, you know, basic principles involved are things like, if the universal statement is true, like all men are mortal is true, well, it has to be true that that would be true in every particular, right? If a universal is true, the corresponding particular has to be true. If all men are mortal, it stands to reason that every single individual human being is also mortal. Um, so there's basic principles that are involved in there um, that you would want to go through, but there's really no shortcut to doing it. You would just have to learn the principles of of, of syllogistic thinking, which is, um, it, it's really the rules of, of rational thinking. And then you can put it into a syllogism and, and make that very easy for your students to, to learn. But you yourself would have to sort of know how you would wanna teach it. If I had to teach it to a, to a teacher, I could probably do that in a few hours. It's not hard. Obviously, we break it down and go very slowly for students over the discovery of deduction, uh, throughout the discovery of deduction. But with with somebody who's really going to kind of get it, it, it you know it doesn't have to take all year to learn how to do it. Thanks, Jolie. Uh, Lisa is hungry for good examples of fallacies. Do you have recommendations for resources? that are easy to understand for both teachers and students um, when it comes to finding um, a good resource bank of fallacies. So um, that is one thing that we are beefing up in the, the new edition of the Art of Argument. But really, what all I can say is 
you've just got to be plugged in to the world around you. Uh, I, I, I know that this probably isn't the answer that you probably want because, but when, when you, I don't want to say this is probably sounds awful, but if you just go dumpster diving for fallacies and I, by that, I mean, like if you go into a Google search and just sort of like ad hominem abusive fallacies or circular reasoning fallacies, you'll, you'll find things that'll pop up. Absolutely. But what you really want to be doing is sort of cultivating within you um, the ability to identify those things in the world around you, in what you're reading and what you're hearing and what you're watching and the conversations that you're having. Because I can tell you this, this is another one of those ways where if you model for your students that the way to find fallacies is do a Google search for them, that's how they'll do it. But if you model for them that, you know what, guys, I was having a conversation with somebody from my church yesterday, and they were telling me about such and such. And I thought to myself, that's a bifurcation fallacy. And I just, I was sort of thinking, and I asked them, are there really only two options? Are those really your only two options here? And then we, as we talk, we're like, no, actually, there's a whole bunch of other options. I spotted the bifurcation fallacy. Your students will hear that you went through that process. They'll be inspired by that. And that's what they'll begin to model. They're going to model whatever it is that you do with them. And I know that it's longer and it takes more time, but there is no sort of sh shortcut to being able to do this and to being able to do it well. Um, of course, I saw somebody put up here, you know, the fallacy detective and the thinking toolbox. Yes, you can go look at some of those kinds of things, but I really want to underscore that if you want this to be something that you, you and your students are going on this journey together and you want them to, to like live life and understand how to use fallacies, you really need to be modeling that by the fact that you're doing that. I've got two more questions for you, Jolie. We'll get through them super quick here. A question from Elizabeth. Um, about teaching cap logic intensively. Um, Elizabeth asks about teaching cap books over the summer. Can we go through cap logic books in an eight week span? Um, is that a little too tight? What's kind of the minimum length of time that a teacher um, could spend going through um, the cap logic books to do the books um, justice and to do right by their students? Well, I guess it really depends on, you know, what your end goal is. I would say if you want students to be like owning and mastering these concepts and you want them to be able to, again, if you want them to take this with them, because they're if they never get another logic class from you, if you've spent just a couple of weeks on it, it's going to feel to them like it was important enough to spend a couple of weeks on. But you know as well as I do that, you um, you know as well as I do that logic is an essential life skill and that we really need to be doing it and, and, and you need to be able to do it well in order to navigate. It is a crazy world out there. So I guess I, the question for, for whoever is asking is, what's your end goal? Do you want them to kind of go through the vocabulary list and kind of have just sort of um, a top level sort of ex, you know exposure to it? Because that's, that's an easy goal. And then it's an easy answer that's yes, um, as far as the informal fallacies go. The discovery of deduction, um, it is, that's not something that most kids have ever bumped into before. Um, and that that's something that would probably take more dedicated, like actual plotting along and studying and, and making sure that they're getting through all of the steps. There is a lot to remember in the discovery of deduction. There is a form and a structure to it. And it's not, a, it's not forgiving. Like it, you have to do it the right way or it's kind of like math or it, it doesn't work in a way. There's no math in it, but it, it, it functions like math in that way. So I guess you just really have to ask yourself, what is your goal? Um, anybody can read through those books in you know a few weeks, but that you have to decide what it is that you really want them to walk away with. And then you kind of build out um, you know, the timing dependent upon what it is that you really want them to walk away with. Thanks, Julie. And the last question, um, kind of a fitting question to end is, um, what's next after going through CAP logic books, whether the student wraps up in 10th grade, 11th or 12th grade, um, how should parents be orienting their students, even if it's sending them off to college? Um, what, what can students do next? What, what either resources could they provide after going through the CAP series? Um, or what, what's a way to nurture our students after uh, the four cap books have kind of run their course, the four cap sure. logic books. Um, 
so the, 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 I guess the, the most natural next step would be to go into a rhetoric program of some kind where they're actually going to be applying. They're going to start with the process of invention, which means they're going to, going to discover an argument. They're going to discover an issue that they want to make an argument about. And then they're going to have to write that thesis. And then they're going to have to prove that thesis. And if they can begin with creating the syllogism that so that they know that my premises, my premises are true, my construction is valid, at the heart of my argument, I have a valid argument, and now I can begin to write and be eloquent and you know write that paper um, after, that supports my thesis, that's that's sort of the one of the most natural ways to do that um, is through rhetoric. The other way, of course. Um, is to help them um, in, ensure that they are they're not being kind of left alone to never discuss it in the future. So if that means that um, they take another class um, in college, um, I, I know that for a lot of a lot of students, part of their general education courses is that they have to take some philosophy classes, and very often logic is one of those classes that can be offered. Um, I taught one of those classes at Eastern University a couple of years ago, um, and students were invited to, I mean, students had that to choose from, and they came and took an introductory course in logic. Um, some of those resources, particularly the Peter Kraft book, the Socratic logic book, is, an, is another good text that kind of, it's, it's aimed at a college level student and in, that would be, you know, a college level exposure to it. Um, but then it's really just got to be something that somebody around them has to reinforce. Um, and just very briefly, I'll note that um, as, by way of example, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I lived there for six or seven years. I had as part of requirement for living there, I, I had to take Arabic three times a week, every single week for every single year that I lived there. And today, I can say a few, I can say hello, I can say goodbye, I can say thank you, I can say um, I know my numbers to 10, and I, I can tell you that you have no brains, because I learned that too. Um, but I can't do anything else with my Arabic. And the reason is my parents didn't learn it, my brother didn't remember it, and nobody ever required it of me. And all of that investment that I got in reading it and speaking it, it's gone. And the same thing is going to be true for logic for your students. If it's not something that is continually practiced and rehearsed, you know, and that they're called back to and sort of expected to be applying as they go, it'll be a class that they took way back when. They'll be able to do their, you know, their parlor tricks just like I can with my Arabic, and that'll be what they can do. So making sure that it's reinforced with friends and family and courses and teachers and everything all along the way will be important if they're going to hang on to it.